Welcome to Popcorn and Compliance, a podcast series where we take a look at movies and try to mine them for leadership and compliance lessons learned. I'm going to begin a series with my colleague Richard Lummis, where we're going to look at movies and we're going to focus a little bit more on leadership than compliance, but we'll also talk about some of the compliance lessons learned that you can use as you move forward moving up the ladder to hopefully become a chief compliance officer. It's going to be a fun series. I know you'll enjoy Richard's insights. He's got some great insights. Obviously a little little bit different than Jay Rosen and Megan Doherty, but that's what makes this series so great. I know you will enjoy it. In this episode, Richard Lummis and I take a look at the 1970 Best Picture winner, The Sting. But first, a quick word from our sponsor, right back. This is Richard Lummis, and I'm here with Tom Fox for another discussion. Today we're going to continue our review of movies that have won the Academy Award for Best Picture with 1973's The Sting, starring Paul Newman and Robert Redford, supported by Robert Shaw, Charles Durning, and Robert Earl Jones as the Robert Earl Jones on the credits. It managed to beat out The Exorcist and American Graffiti for Best Picture. Other notable films of the year were The Paper Chase and Paper Moon. Marvin Hamlish won for the adapted score, featuring mainly the music of Scott Joplin. The movie's a lot of fun, and the plot's really too complicated to summarize, but basically it features Newman and Redford as con men setting up an elaborate con of a mobster in 1936 Chicago. I don't think I'd seen it since it was in the theaters, but this is really a fun movie. What do you think, Tom? It is, and there's a couple of things I would like to talk about the production first before we get into, I think, our utter joy at this film and what lessons you might be able to draw from this from a business leadership perspective. The first thing I noticed was the overall visual impact of the the film, and that was in large part due to two Oscar-winning performances, one by a costume designer who I was stunned to find was Edith Head had been around from the 40s. She was a well-known costume designer. I had always thought of her as a costume designer for mainly period pieces, but then I did some research into her, and it's much broader than that. Sort of the, uh, the classic 50s stylized look. She had developed that. You named the 50s uh, star, and she dressed her. And she actually was the costume designer and won an Oscar. And what she did was try to have very bold monotones, browns, maroons, dark blues, a few light blues to set people off, but they were very bold monotones. And it reminded me of, in many ways, I found the original Star Trek to be more visual appealing than any of the other series, largely because the boldness of the colors. The reason the original Star Trek colors were so bold was it was the early days of color TV, and they had to light it up so they could get the resolution for the cameras. It looks much more colorful, particularly now in in the Blu-ray or other enhanced versions as opposed to The Next Generation or any of the other series which followed. But the costume design, I think, were one of the things that really made the movie for me. Second was the art direction and set direction. There were two individuals who won for Academy Awards for that. And once again, the art direction was just stunning. The set direction, if that wasn't a 30s backlot of a, what I think of as a movie, Studios 30 backlot, I don't know what, if one exists. But it was just everything that I would think of around a depression, a depression era, Chicago or other large metropolitan or urban area. And you noted the music. Um, the uh, Scott Joplin ragtime although we probably were aware of some of Scott Joplin's songs as young children, Ragtime was really not seen as having a major influence at that point in time. And Marvin Hamlish, to his eternal credit, brought that back for that movie, and it added a completely unique, at that time, sound, and one that probably resonates in our heads today. If we hear Scott Joplin, we're probably going to think of the sting. And so those three things, I thought, production-wise, really helped make the movie. And here's the fun fact I have for you. The script was discovered in a, quote, slush pile, end quote, of scripts at an agent's office by Rob Cohen. You may or may not recognize that name because Rob Cohen was a Fast and Furious director. 
But in 1968, he was an intern reader for some agent, and he found this script, and he wrote a glowing review of the script and said this would be an Oscar-winning film. And that's how this script got to the attention of the agent who got to the attention of the producers, showing that it's not just Betty Grable and her legs that are <laughs> discovered in Hollywood. Sometimes it's a script. So I found that really interesting. It is. Once again, as our prior movie in How Green Was My Valley, I'm not sure there are direct business leadership lessons. There are certainly some leadership styles that we could talk about in this movie, but in terms of leadership lessons, because of the nefarious nature of basically all of the characters, <laughs> unless you took perhaps the opposite of it, culture-wise, I'm not sure that there are things that we can emulate, but there were some things that I thought really should have made Robert Shaw the Robert, Robert Shaw, the, the gangster character, Doyle Lonigan, in just a fabulous role. On the limp, I found out, was he actually had torn his ligaments in his knee playing racquetball while preparing <laughs> for the film, and he didn't want to have surgery and lose the role, so he limped through the film. That's why he That's had the limp. That's interesting. I wondered what yeah, that was Yeah, I thought he was just doing that actor thing. Yeah. You could probably tell by our voices, and this is just a movie about our joy. But the card game. So in uh, the card game occurs on a train... From New York to Chicago, Paul Newman gets himself invited to the card game, and he has done a great amount of research on Lonigan and discovered that Lonigan cheats. He likes to deal in decks with threes and fours to give a player the impression that he's got three threes or three fours or perhaps even four of each. And then Lonigan comes above him with sevens and eights. Paul Newman, being a better card shark, actually deals over that and deals himself, I think, uh, queens, jacks. And he doesn't deal them. He swaps them out switch. because the dealer has to apologize to Lonigan. I know I dealt him the threes. <laughs> <laughs> swapped them out. And uh, so that should have been the first sign to Lonigan that when he got cheated at the card game, of course, as a crime boss... He wants to put a hole in his head before the next tunnel, but he doesn't. A second red flag, Paul Newman sends Robert Redford, playing Kelly, to pick up the winnings. And he re reveals his scheme to take over Paul Newman's operations to Lonigan. Lonigan, it seemed to me, and he also Kelly also revealed, Robert Redford also says they were from the same area of New York, Hell's Kitchen. And that seemed to make a difference to Lonigan. At any rate, I thought Lonigan really fell for that bait as much as any of the bait he was given throughout the movie. And he really saw um, saw a lot of himself in young the young Kelly character. The as with any good con, yeah. the movie is so fast paced that you don't notice the plot holes until it's too late. The, the next uh, red flag was the, uh, the setup in the drugstore, where, and in this part of the story, the Kelly character was allegedly getting an insider tip, or actually a post, a past posting tip from his Western Union contact via phone call at the drugstore. And uh, drugstores are a well-known trope from Hollywood in the 30s, so I found it, uh, and they had the fountain and everything, yeah. so how can you not, and the glass enclosed phone booth, and really everything you'd want. And Lonigan falls for that as well. And he goes and places a bet, and then he wins, or he's late. They do what's called a shutout, which uh, two, yeah. <laughs> two of the grifters <laughs> jump in front of him so that he can't get the bet down because they couldn't pay out. They didn't have enough cash. That should have been yet another red flag. Now we get to the due diligence. My, <laughs> what is due diligence? Is due diligence going to one of the things in the anti-corruption world we call due diligence? Is actually going to a customer's location to see if they have a real office. If it's not, is it a mailbox? Is it an office that really doesn't appear to have the kind of ongoing business that they say they have when they want to do business with you and your organization? But this is Western Union. The Kid Twist character takes over the office and is able to, Kelly brings him into a side door. They visit quickly, and uh, this is enough for the due diligence to satisfy Lonigan. But it was a brilliant part of the scam, where, showing once again that trust but verify. Ronald Reagan was right, and uh, you have to do a little bit more than seeing something with your eyes. And then the final part, I would have to say, was not necessarily the scam, but the ineptitude of Lonigan. And that was the bet, which the instructions were place it on, I can't remember the horse's name. Now, if you've ever put a bet down in a horse race, there's win, show, and place, or win, place, and show, I should say. And the bet was, Lonigan put it all down to win. 
And when he realized or was told that the bet was placed, he uh, something wasn't right. He yet was yet to realize he'd been scammed. But if you get instructions, that's why pilots, or I should say submariners, repeat instructions. So that there's no <laughs> there's no misunderstanding. And if you don't understand or they've been given to you too quickly, ask for the instructions to be repeated. And if it says place the bet, then you should clarify. Do you mean to place it on or do you mean put it to win? Yep. Those are some of the red flags that I saw throughout this. But I'm with you. This movie was just a ton of fun. I remember seeing it... Uh, when it came out, I remember the first time it was on television, and the uh, that glorious soundtrack played, and it's still just as much fun. Yeah, the uh, you mentioned the set design. One of the things that struck me was how beautiful the painted backdrops were. They're obviously painted in, a, in an homage to the 1930s movies, as well as the time that the the film was set in. But I thought that was interesting. The uh, Edith Head, of course, was the inspiration for the character of Edna Mode in The Incredibles which indicates that she's still influential in Hollywood. One of the things about the music is it was ragtime, which is from the 1890s. And the jazz age, of course, was the 20s, and we shifted into the big band era by the 30s. So I think that was actually a signal that it was anachronistic. Just the the Gondorf character played by Newman was really um, over the hill, lost. He was an anachronism in the modern world. And the con they chose to use was called The Wire, and... They said that it was so outdated, nobody would remember it. I thought that was one of the more subtle things in the movie. One of the other things I got from it was the importance of accurate technical language. The con men have their own language, and with just a couple of words, they could immediately summarize an entire con, and everybody knew what they were talking about. So I think that's something that's important. I think you, you touched on Lonigan's importance of reputation, sense that if it gets out that he got taken in a con, then it's going to be viewed as weakness, and he's going to be replaced slash killed. Criminal syndicates do have very low pension liabilities, but so that that was one of the lessons. The other one was the relationship between Redford's Johnny Hooker and uh, the Gondorf character. Redford is clearly the junior partner, but he hides information from Gondorf, and he's nearly killed for his trouble. So it's, it is very important to share all information, including negative information, like there are hitmen chasing you, with your partner. And it also showed up that there's really no substitute for experience. The Hooker character has all the raw talent in the world. Robert Earl Jones says he's the best he's ever seen. But he's totally undisciplined. And so he's always going to be a small timer. You need the experience and the discipline of the Gondorf character. Finally, I thought there was the use of informal networks. You've often talked about this, but they're able to put together this elaborate con with lots of other people brought in, basically through an informal network of yeah. past associates. 48 hours, it yeah. looks like. <laughs> so I thought, yes, it was a wonderful movie. Highly recommended. Yes, and I would just double the recommendation. You haven't seen it in a while, and heaven forbid you've never seen it. Please go watch it. It's a ton of fun, and Newman and Redford really, if you saw the witch casting the Sundance Kid, they have a great rapport, and they continued it. In this movie, I'm sorry they weren't ever able to make any others together, but uh, this was a worthy successor to Butch Cat. Well, that's a good summary. So for now, this is Richard Lummis and Tom Fox. This is Tom Fox again. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of Popcorn and Compliance. If you haven't checked out my newest short series, Never the Same, I hope you will do so. It's a series focused on how business has changed forever after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I did this with Brandon Daniels, CEO, President at Exeter. We took up five topics, supply chain, trade and economic sanctions, and I brought Brianna Corruption Compliance, Cybersecurity, and ESG. I know you will enjoy it and find it very interesting. All on the Compliance Podcast Network. We look forward to visiting with you again on Popcorn and Compliance.